Um, all right, let's 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 do this. Um, I'm happy to be here again and see some familiar faces. And Charlotte, well, thanks thanks for coming back. And everybody, welcome, thanks for coming back. So anybody who's currently here, but that I can't see, there's any way we can see your face, bring it on so we can have an actual mirror connection. Shout out to, I think that's Sophie. No, no, that's, 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 that's not Sophie. It says, it says RJ. It is in. Yes, all right. Thank you. Everybody is coming through. Thank you. I'm happy to see you guys' faces. So the first thing I want to, to prompt before we even start is here's a question for you. And everybody should answer this question, um, maybe in the chat. Today is Monday. What is something that you did well over the weekend? Right? Let me say it again. What's one thing that you did well over the weekend? Put your answer in the chat. And this is for everyone. What is one thing that you did well? Okay, I see I made a beautiful whole fish. All right, ate a lot of my son's birthday cake. <laughs> oh, I baked a cookie cake, huh, all right. Okay, I got, I got up on sleep. Reconnected with old friends, yep. Finished some homework assignments. I read a book, I'm curious about what that book was about. Read an inspiring book and hit a good for uh, forehand vo volleys. Look at that. That's awesome. Thanks for sharing. I'm actually curious, Casey. What's book? What book is that? What's the book about? Uh, it was actually Stephen King's newer book, the 112263, where someone <laughs> goes and tries to stop the Kennedy assassination. I'm a history teacher, so like anything history related, I'm like all about. And sometimes I like fiction in there, so it was good. I'm glad you got to do that. <laughs> uh, that is. Great. That actually is a great. Great. Yeah, it was so so good, it but you don't different. get a lot of time to just like actually sit down and read for fun unless you intentionally make it. Amen to that. Yeah, hopefully okay. our kids can see this one. We'll be we'll be talking about this one in leadership. So Ray, we'll 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 be rocking on this one. That's awesome. Me two point oh. So the reason why I start this way is, is because the questions we ask ourselves are extremely important and. For some of you guys, when you heard that question at first, maybe it was even difficult to think about the answer because we aren't used to it. We're used to two things. We're used to general questions such as, how's it going? Or how was your weekend? And it's easy to just kind of say something, oh, it was okay, without thinking about the answer. That's the first thing. The second thing is we're used to questions that are geared towards the negative. Um, like, oh, did anything, was, what was wrong this weekend? Or what happened this weekend? And then your brain goes to the wrong right away, the negative right away. And if you've been with me for two weeks now, you know that that makes sense because the second your brain hears a question, it is wired to start scanning your experience and thinking about what's the one thing that was bad. And that's where your brain goes first. By asking simple questions like, what, what's one thing that you, you did well? You start to train your brain to actually become accustomed to finding the things that you did well, because those things are there, right? We don't invent them, that they are, they are there. Our brains aren't, just aren't wired to focus on them. So our topic today is positive psychology and optimism. That's why I started with a question that was geared towards pushing your brain to be positive and optimistic. Now, when people used to think about psychology, it used to be a field that focused on asking people, what are the things that are wrong? What are the things that are not working? What's wrong with you? You would say, oh, I can't sleep. Um, I don't get along with my, with, my, with my siblings or with my, my family. I don't have friends. Um, I have headaches all the time. And then they would try to fix those things. So what's wrong? Let's fix it. And then somebody said, we should switch the formula and ask what's right, what's working? What makes you happy? Right? And when you start listing those things, then we maximize those things. 
So if you list the things that are positive and you maximize them, it works better to help you than saying what's wrong and how do I fix it? So my first tip for you today is for the entire week, I, need, I want you to intentionally look for the things that you are doing well and the things that, the things that make you happy and make a list of those things. Just write them down. That's all, it's that simple. Okay, I'm gonna show you a video that I made on optimism. And I made this video, I think I shared it with you when COVID started, I was working with people who I couldn't see in person anymore. So I asked myself, how can I keep helping people without seeing them? And I just started making these videos and I use them during uh, events like these ones. So I'll show you an, a, a two minute video on optimism. Then I'm gonna put you guys into breakout rooms to answer a few questions. And before, um, before I play the video, I'm gonna write in the chat the way I want you to think about the conversation you're gonna have in your breakout room. So I'm gonna write three words there and explain. Inside application and then action. So I wrote there in the chat, insight, application and action. And I want you guys to think about these three words and remember them because you're gonna use them for this video but I think that can be helpful for you in general. Anytime you watch a little video or you read something or you have a conversation that you find like it's really, really impactful, it's easy for you to just think, oh, that was great and move on with your life. But the people who actually get, a, get something from it have a formula to make sure they learn something. And here's one of those formulas. First, ask yourself, what insight did I get from this conversation or this video? or this book, what's the insight? What did I learn? Two, application. How can that apply to my life, right? Just ask yourself, you know, that was an interesting point that he made, or that was a cool movie. Um, how does that apply to my life? And then three, the single most important, what action can I take to try to improve my life based on what I just learned? Again, what's the insight? How does it apply for me, to me? And then what action can I take? So, so as you watch this video, think about those three things, because when I put you guys into breakout rooms, you will talk about the insight, the application, and the action. All right, so screen sharing time. Let's stop two, and here we go. Let's talk about optimism and why it's important for you to actively work on cultivating optimism in your life. Now, what is optimism? All it is is scanning the world with a lens, looking for the positive, looking for hope, looking for happy. And the first reason why you want to do that intentionally is that your brain actually has a negativity bias. That means that if you don't try at all, you focus on the negative. And that was important for our ancestors if you think about evolution. So if a warrior a long time ago walked into a room somewhere and there were friends, but then one tiger somewhere, the warrior wants to see the tiger first so he can fight it or run away from it. Although the world has changed and there's no tigers around right now, our brains haven't changed. So that's why, for example, you may have a friend or a spouse or a cousin who has done amazing things to you, has been loyal for 15 years, and yet, because this year they forgot your birthday, this year they forgot to make plans for dinner, your brain focuses on that negative thing. So you need to intentionally work on finding the positive because if not, the default setting is negative. The second reason why it's important to actively work with optimism is that when you think about how limited our perspectives are, it's actually super interesting. Your brain, every single day has to ignore almost everything that does not matter to it and focus only on what matters to you. So for example, if you say my task is driving to school or driving to work, your brain gets the task and you focus on that only. You have to ignore almost everything else around you. So you can zero in on the mission. You find what you seek. That's why, for example, when your brain has been trained to hear a word, it recognizes that word first when other things are being said. Let's say you go to a party and people are talking, this white noise, you don't really understand what they're saying, but then you hear your name and you recognize your name right away. Or you just bought a brand new car and next thing you know, everywhere you go, you see the same car everywhere because your brain is trained to focus on that car. That's how optimism works. 
You need to teach your brain to focus on the things that are positive, the things that make you happy, the things that are hopeful. And then you will start seeing it automatically when your brain has changed. The saying that goes with it is the following. You view the world not as it is, but as you are. So if you change the way you are, then you can change your perception of, of the world of the positive. And that's why optimism is important. All right. So that so that was that, right? And I really want you guys to kind of dig in, into this in your small groups. What insights did you get from this? How would some of those apply to you and to your life? And what action can you take to actually use this knowledge? And I'm gonna give you guys just like three to four minutes in breakout rooms before we come back. So once you get the invite for the breakout rooms, accept it, and then I will see you guys here in a few minutes. Okay, invite sent. You know, I really like the background on your video. That pink is absolutely gorgeous. Oh, thank you. Thank you. You know, I, I try to keep, keep it interesting because um, everything that's on the video, from the language to the music to the background, is a chance to, to keep the eye interested. Um, so I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, I, I really like that. And um, I liked also the, the um, graphics too. And, how it just sort of that, you know, the, the explosion part, all those things, I think, keep the interest, you know, the eye um, can, you know, interested in the video and the images. So good for you. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Make sure I put a timer here. Uh, Let's talk about Good grammar and spelling are important, but if you want to write essays that inspire Thank 
Welcome back. We got 15 more seconds and then we're going to have everybody back. So let's wait. And we're all back. Welcome back. All right. Talk to me. What did you guys discuss in your group in terms of the video, especially in terms of some insights that you get, how it applied and how and what action you might take? Talk to me. Go ahead, Sarah. You know, <laughs> um, one thing we were saying what we learned and one thing I learned was even if you think something's negative, you can always make it seem po uh, positive. Like if you just got a new car, but you see somebody else with a better car, like a cooler car, like a Ferrari, you can still say, oh, well, I worked hard to get this car. I deserve it. And it's a really cool car. At least I have a car. So and that's like how you can make it positive. I love that. And, and Sarah, learn, realize every, everything we talk about here weekly, these are like superpowers. So I hope you realize what you just did right there. You can be in a situation where you literally teach your brain to shift the way it looks at things. And that can change your life completely. When somebody else who doesn't have that same tool might just not even have that in the realm of possibilities for their brain. So what you're learning there is extremely important. You can just switch the thinking, the perspective like that. And it, it is a superpower, so keep that. Anybody else? Go ahead, Charlotte. Everyone's Chloe and Maria were great. Like everyone's on mute. Go for it. Well, in my, I was with Mr. Ray and Thais, and so we talked about how we really like the, the the idea of the video about training your your mind to overrule the negative negative aspects you see of life. So, and he gave us a, like a, an advice or like a technique to like try and uh, train it is by, even though if you say one thing negative, try and say two things positive, that it overweighs the negative or the, the, the negative over the positive. It, thanks Charlotte. And I want you guys to connect this to everything we've learned, we learned the past couple of weeks because we aren't saying that the negative doesn't exist. We aren't saying that you should pretend it's not there. We're just saying that since your brain is wired to only focus on the negative and to over-exaggerate how much negative there is, we need to be aware of that so that we can change things. Uh, so we can change things then and, and focus more on the positive so things can be even out. Because if you don't do that work, your brain just goes to the negative automatically. So. That's a good technique. If you could try to accept that the negative exists, but try to have a couple more examples of, of, of the positive, that's a good way to start rewiring your brain like we discussed last time. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Anybody else? All right, 
represent? I know Chloe or Maria is going to represent. So in my group, um, something we were talking about was that um, I think usually when people have positive thoughts or when you say like you're confident in something, you're like affirming and like telling the universe that it's gonna happen so it's like every time some you have a positive thought on like let's say a test and you're not sure if you're gonna do well but you're confident you know what I'm gonna do well I, I have faith in myself and like even if you didn't study that much you're like calling the good vibes into your life and I think that's like what positive affirmation is it makes you feel more confident in yourself and that's why I think people do better when they think positively Thanks, Maria. And if I can add the science to that, uh, we talked about this last time, I believe, that when they looked at brain scans of people, they, they looked at somebody who was playing the piano and somebody who was pretending to play the piano, the same parts in the brain actually light up. So somebody who's an athlete, for example, who actually visualizes the play, right? The pass, the three-point shot, the dive, the, like all those things, your brain by the time you get to the actual uh, field, your brain actually feels like you've been there before, you've done that before, just because you spend time thinking about it and visualizing it. So the same is true for giving a speech somewhere, right? You prepare for the speech, but then you actually spend time seeing yourself in that position, inspiring people. And when you show up, your brain is not as nervous because it feels like you've been there before. Those are good insights. I I have a question on, on like the visualizing stuff. It, sometimes I actually find it very hard. I mean, from an athlete perspective and, and I don't know, it, it's like, I almost have to see myself as somebody else doing it. It's hard for me to see myself hit like a massive serve, you know, and, and it, it's, but I can like picture Roger Federer doing it, but it's really actually hard for me to see myself do it. The right so, way. That, so that skill is, is that exactly the, the skill of visualization and sometimes even like meditation, for example, it's, it's almost as if it's literally you learning how to step back, right? And watch yourself do something because there's something about staying attached to your identity that makes us always ask questions, always have doubts, almost feel like, no, I can't be the one doing that. But the more you learn how to just kind of sit still and doing that, the more your brain starts to almost like separate yourself from yourself and watch yourself. It's like, and the best way is one cool way to do this is to actually have recordings of yourself doing great things, right? If you have a friend of yours who's like recorded you uh, playing the piano or playing soccer or basketball, it's not because you planned it, you were just doing your thing, they recorded you, watch that. And if you can practice this skill, it's almost like, wow, is that is that really me? And for me, I'm actually okay with the fact that I may, I may take it in the sense of, it's a version of me. Like I'm okay with the fact that this is not a me who's like talking to my friends right now, no. It's a version, oh, that's game time, Dito. That's, that's the one. So I wanna tap into that game time version of myself when I do like visualization. And your brain is good at that because it learns, oh, okay, when we play a game, this is the version of ourselves. When we give a speech, it's this version. And when we're just chilling, it's this version. So that separation isn't always a bad thing if you can leverage that. That's a really good, that's a really good question, a good, a good point. Um, oh, thanks, Ray. Thanks, thanks for showing up, Ray. Go ahead. I have a question. So Chloe brought up a good point with us. She was talking about her relationship, actually, and, and Chloe chime in kind of with your horse. Cause like, it's, it's weird. Sometimes we're talking about relationships, you know, when I think of it one way with my sport, it's like, how can I be better? How can I see myself the best? But then we're talking about interpersonal relationships. How can I be a better partner, a better friend? Um, you know, just, you know, I always think of it as empathy is like trying to put myself in the other person's shoes and, and understanding and then staying positive, like understanding if they're going through something or, you know, so there's these different things. And, and Chloe brought up, brought up an interesting point. It was with a horse and, and how important that relationship as a rider is. Chloe, do you want to maybe talk a little bit about what you said? Sure. Um, so lately writing, I've been going through a little rough patch uh, due to like my relationship with my horse. And um, she bucked me off. So that kind of scares me. But um, I feel like one 
once I put myself in the negative mindset that I'm going to fall, it happens most of the time. And um, when I try to say to myself, um, I'm enjoying myself, I, I really, I have another perspective on my horse and kind of try to block out the negatives of um, I'm going to fall. Yeah, and, and okay, I'm gonna go a little deeper just because your questions are taking me there, but I think you guys are ready for it. So, so there's the idea of flow, right? And, and of, of, of synchronicity. And there's something called group flow. The individual flow, we're more used to it, right? It's like when you are in that, um, you feel your best and perform your best. And just like the ideas come, like you, you don't even think about them and you can be doing one thing for three hours and you don't even see the time go by. But the group flow is also a thing. And the thing with group flow is, it's almost like the horse or your teammates can feel your energy. Right, like if it's like it's like it's. Let me go back to like teaching. If you when you're a teacher, it's so super simple. People used to ask me, but how you're giving all this advice about if a student does this, ask them to do this or tell them to do that. How do you? But what if they refuse to do it? And I'm like, that never crossed my mind. Like it's I never even played with that scenario of like why would they re refuse? Like, what do you mean? I just ask them to step here so we can talk. Like I don't even think about that. And there's something to that, right? So the way you approach the game, the way you approach writing, there's something about that energy that the, the whatever the brain waves you have in your in your mind that are actually dictating how other people respond to you. That's one thing. And the second thing is that they've actually done stu studied the brain of people who have been together for a long time, or people who like vibe together, or they've gone to like concerts, like a big like uh, like concerts, and there's like you have the brains actually kind of go at the same, with the same waves. If you're all watching this, the same concert, this, I don't know how to explain it, I really don't, but, but it's, it's an actual thing. So uh, I, I, one of my favorite like philosophers calls that peopling, like, like people and people's brains peopling because you're the two brains almost start to like, be on, be, like mirror, be, mirror each other. And I argue that the same is, 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 is true with your horse. Um, and, and, and I think that explains what you just said. So when you have the negative mindset, uh, it can affect people around you, just like your horse as well. I hope that makes sense. I just gonna went there because you guys asked the question. And it's the same, whether it's tennis or ski. I mean, it, again, sports end up being an, a, a bit of an easy example, but you know, we just finished another couple of tennis players here at the Australian Open and, and a, a very good friend of mine did very well. He got to the quarterfinals and he lost in the quarterfinals. And when I watched his match, I could see it all happen at one point. Like I see the shift. Like like if you look at a professional tennis match, for example, or soccer, like like when teams are playing well, like soccer teams, like they start flowing in one. And so like you know, you look at basketball, like how could someone know, you know, Magic Johnson passing behind his back, but the guy's red, like the, the, the interconnectivity. And it's weird in an individual sport like tennis, the ebb and flow of the match could be one point, but the energy just changed. Like everything about it just switched and you could almost tell it. It's, you don't have to watch the match. Like you, you, you can almost, if you had like a blackout, but you could feel sort of vibrations, you would know which side, like which the energy levels just go. It's, kind of profound so one thing i want you guys to think about as you think about all this right is is what we call mirror neurons so i'm sure you've noticed this before right so i used to wonder about um going to orlando here go to magic kingdom and all that and i and i always wondered why i personally felt so happy when i was there and i it, it used to bother me because i would say look it's the summertime it's like 90 degrees, these guys are wearing Mickey suits that weigh I don't know how much. And just like, like, why is it, they're always smiling. There's something about people who work there who are just like, they have this positive energy. They are trained to kill you with kindness, with smiles and intentionally or unintentionally that affects you as well. So there's something in our brains called mirror neurons, which means that we are actually wired to mimic the emotions of people around us. That's why if I tell you, for example, uh, call your best friend and ask your best friend to just laugh out of control, 
and your challenge is to stare at your best, your best friend for like one minute and you're not, you aren't allowed to laugh or smile. That would be very difficult because it's contagious. And it's contagious because your brain is wired to be this way. Now, that works for the positive and that works for the negative. Unfortunately, that means that I can tell you right now, if you tell me the four to five people you spend the most time with, and I spend some time with them, I can tell you exactly what on average your level of optimism or pessimism is going to be. And people think this is a joke, but it's so, it's so real. It literally affects you. If the people you spend the most time with are people who tend to look for the things that work well, the things that make them happy, the things that are positive, you become that way as well. And your brain is healthier. But if you have people around you who are chronically negative, Intentionally or not, your brain is wired to want to be like that. And I always share this example with people. When I started teaching, I loved my job right away. And yet, when I would go out with my friends who were also teachers, we'd go out a group of maybe like 12 or 13 people. And we'd be like eating, having dinner. And they would start talking about one-on-one, -on -one, one at a time, talk about how, how much they hate their jobs, how much it's so hard, they can't stand this or that. And as they were coming close to me, I was just thinking to myself, this is weird. I love my job, but I hope at least one person before me is doing something, something positive. And I would wait, negative, 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 negative. And before it gets to me, I start feeling so bad and start saying, gosh, I don't want to be the jerk who just says like, I'm sorry you guys are having a bad time. I love my job. And so by the time it got to me, guess what I did the first time? I found something negative to say also. And when I did that, I went home and I thought to myself, but why did I do that? And the more I learned about the brain, the more I realized your brain is just wired to want to fit in that way. And, and I did not want to stand out by sharing something positive. And of course, over, over, over the long term, I, I stopped hanging out with them. But right now, I carefully, carefully select who I spend the most time with. And speaking of positive psychology, I'm not asking you guys to focus on who is negative around you. No, it is what it is. What I'm saying is I challenge you to find people who are positive around you and intentionally spend more time with them. Just hanging out with them, just being around that energy, I'm telling you, is going to transform your life. Um, and I hope it's something you, you, you can try. Uh, we only have a few minutes, but I want to share another exercise with you. Uh, before we close out. So, but this one, mirror neurons, don't forget, spend more time with positive people. So here's a good exercise for perspective taking. It is called worst case scenario, best case scenario, most likely case scenario. When something happens that's negative, obviously, and you're not happy, this is really good because it walks uh, your brain through the steps necessary to de-escalate the situation. For example, I used this the first time when I was a high school teacher, I taught juniors. So during my lunch, uh, no, during my planning period, a student of mine comes, right? It's a girl. And she and her boyfriend are both my students, but he's in a different class now. She comes to me, she says, hey, Mr. Bala, look, I have a problem. What's going on? She's like, I'm so angry because I texted uh, my boyfriend and he didn't get back to me. So that's, that's interesting. Mind you, at the, the school policy is that we can't have cell phone in class. So she says, this is terrible. I'm like, okay, so when, how long ago did you send him the text? She's like, you know, about 45 seconds. I'm like, okay, it's only been 45 seconds and you're already losing it. So I'm going to walk through these three, case, these three cast, uh, types of scenarios. First thing first, let's talk about the worst case scenario. What's the worst thing that could be happening right now? Let's write that down. She's like, okay, well, maybe he saw my text and he, made, he frowned because he couldn't stand seeing my name on his cell phone. And he's been upset with me for a long time. Just he's waiting the perfect time to tell me. Maybe um, he regrets the day we met. I mean, she just went on and on and on. I said, okay, write all those things down. By the time we're done with that, I said, okay, cool. We have that here. Let's go to the best case scenario. She's like, oh, I don't know. I'm like, let me help you. Maybe best case scenario, he is outside now buying flowers for you and he's hoping that when you come out of my classroom he's going to be on one knee 
with his flowers saying, I want to invite you to prom. And when we're 38, I want to marry you. Like, and the more I went there, the more she was laughing. But I said, do it with me. We wrote all those things. And if you notice there, this is what I've done. First, I validated the negative feelings and we wrote them. Second, I pushed the brain to go to the extreme positive and I added a little bit of humor there, funny things like exaggerate. What that does is by the time you get to the most likely case scenario, your brain has gone from being in amygdala mode. We talked about the amygdala the first time, amygdala, emotional, emotional mode. It's gone from that to close, slowly, slowly, slowly coming down the amygdala and even finding humor into the best case scenario. That means that by the time we get to the most likely case scenario, your brain is where it needs to be again to think clearly. So by that point, I asked her, so now what do you think is the most likely case scenario? She's like, oh, his phone is turned off because when you're in class, your phone is supposed to be turned off. I'm like, there you go, over. So this simple exercise, I use it constantly constantly when something happens to me i feel bad about it i start with i do that with myself if you want to skip the worst case scenario and and you're new to this exercise it'd be very difficult so at first you want to spend time just like like write those things let those thoughts come out talk to somebody but you can't stop at the worst case you must go to the best case and then go to the most likely case and by that point you've taken your amygdala from to here all right i'm going to start sharing my screen um, so those are, those are some exercises that I use and I hope you guys can use. Um, in fact, I'm going to add that to my, the, the challenge of the week, uh, in addition to what I said earlier, which was try to try to write the things that you're good at, the things that are positive. First challenge, second challenge, spend more time with people who are positive. Third one, use worst case, best case, most likely case and see what happens. All right. I know it's time, but we're done. But I mean, if you have questions. <laughs> That's so awesome, guys. That is that 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 will help in in. I mean, I will just say in anxiety. I mean, I think everyone has anxiety, and that exercise and starting with like the worst, and then going the best, and you you kind of realize that most likely things fall somewhere in between, <laughs> and uh, and if you're okay with that, it 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 really will uh, will make a difference. So, Charlotte. Yeah, I had a question. So I feel like it happens many times. I don't know for other people, but like when another person like you hang out a lot is negative, how could you like with a mirror in your own brain, how could you try and change, not change them, but like either avoid like getting their negative or like trying to help them? I feel like both ways and also individual wise, how could you like stop the situation? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good one. And this is what I've done my, I mean, for the past eight years, I've been working on, on this with multiple people in myself, right? So it starts with a few things. The, the, the single most important thing is to work on yourself first, right? Because if you haven't worked on yourself, it'd be almost impossible for you to, to affect somebody else. So it goes back to the things I've been sharing with you. Make sure you have a morning routine that is geared towards making your brain focus on the positive. Make sure that you, you select uh, activities, you watch movies, listen to songs and things like that that make you a little more positive and practice these things. That's one. Two, have fun with this. I love, I love shifting perspective near people who are negative. I love that. I once went on a road trip with a good friend of mine who's just like so negative. And I said, look, I don't want to go on a trip with this guy because of this reason. But it'd be a little weird for me to get out of this. I don't know how to get out of this one. So there's different categories. There's the friends that I just had to say goodbye to. It wasn't that important. It's like, it's too negative, it's too much time, I can't do it. There's some is like, no, we're, we, we're, really, we're homies, I can't do that to you. So I made it a game to every single time, and I would listen at first, don't interrupt them. Every single time he would start and like spin something negatively, I would hear that out in my head, that would be the worst case scenario. And I would just hit him with the best case scenario. And he didn't know what I was doing. It was a game for me. But what, you, what, what that does is it's, it's, it's unintentional. It starts to change the person because the same way 
if you spend time around them, they affect you. If they spend time around you, it affects them. And that, I mean, he's a lot less negative now, but it wasn't because of that one uh, field, uh, that, one, that one road trip. It's because we spent so much time together. And at this point, I'm an expert at validating what's negative, but showing you the real examples of, of, of what you have. And here's a good way to do that too, right? I teach people to learn how to not focus on the things that they don't have or the things they can't do, but on what they do have and they can do. And it's easy. Ask any person who's negative. Okay, sure. What are the things that you can't do? They're going to list. Great. Now we did that. Let's talk about the things you can do. Instinct is nothing. It's like, no, come on. The simplest things possible. Like the fact that you are a good communicator. The fact that you can walk. And listen, I don't joke with this. This is simple things. Like you have your two legs. I know people who are amputees who don't have that. Like I go with the simplest things. And the more you shift from what I don't have to what I have, what I can do to what I can do, it is amazing. And the things that you have, when, when I play this one with people, what are the things that you have? When I start listening to things that we have, if you compare to most people on this planet, we are so fortunate with the things that we have. So I just have those things and I make them a game. And I say game because... If it's not a game, then it starts to stress you out. Yeah. And the truth is, somebody else's negativity is not really your responsibility. It's not. You're responsible for your sense of positivity. But then, because you love them, you want to help them. But help them in a way that's a little playful. Because if not, it, be it could become too stressful. That's what has worked for me. Can I also add Dido and Charlotte? This is um, Dr. Hong here. Hi, I don't think we've met, but I do think that, you know, I, I agree with you so completely, but um, I think, you know, recognizing pain is pain when people go through pain. And as uh, Dido says, to validate wh what they're feeling and, um, and listening and being compassionate, but then also um, allowing them to like, uh, do a little bit of, you know, that kind of wallowing, which is so human, but then, um, you know, feeling as like, as you do for yourself and to them to like turn that corner a little bit, right? And, and uh, to be really compassionate and gentle with them so that they can turn the corner. Because I think, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, um, how fortunate you are when you're suffering pain, you know, pain is pain. And if we recognize that for what it is, I think we could be gentler to ourselves and to, you know, the ones we care about. Because I sometimes find the most negative people are sometimes, you know, the most um, engaging people, right? Sometimes, because they're just, they're just, you know, entertaining. But, you know, so you have to realize, like, how you balance that in your life, right? Having that kind of, you uh, you know, a balance of that in your life. So, yeah. So, so that's why, so that's why those levels are important. And that's why you want to put everything we've learned, we've learned together, uh, the, in, uh, together, together, put it together. Right. We talked about the importance of the non-judgment. That's why it, it's, it's playful. It's not, it's not judgmental, right? Me being in the car with my friend, it's like, come on, dude. Like I'm, I'm laughing inside the sense of this is so interesting. Right. I don't judge him for being that way because that's not, that's not helpful. Um, but also I have my own self-care, right? So again, when it gets to the point where I can't take it, that's why I've had to say goodbye to certain people because I just learned that the, more, the harder I tried, the, the more I felt like I was not succeeding. The, I, I took too much on me when it, it was never really about me. So when you do all those things mindfully, which means by being present and with no judgment, you can trust that you are going to be okay. That's a good one. Uh, uh, Mindy, thank you for adding that. The last thing I would add um, with that is to understand that, you know, their issues, like wh whatever they're doing, it's not you. Like it's, 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 it's in them. And so that's really important because to try to be a good friend, a lot of times it gets put on you. And so you take that burden upon yourself. And I think that there's a difference between acknowledgement and, and understanding than, than actually not letting it Pierce, so you have to almost create a force field that you'll be able to reach out, but it can't necessarily get you. And I like to do this with um, smiling and laughing. So that game of best case usually turns into have a laugh about it. 
I mean, yeah. because it's, it, but not in a, in a sarcastic, mean way. Um, you know, you guys are all in high school, so it's different, but obviously everyone here that's married or in a relationship knows that things that are important, like if you end up laughing, like the, the, the advice I always got was never go to bed angry, like always go to bed laughing or smiling. And that will probably help cure it because what does seem like someone's worst case to you, you're probably in your head, you could be like, that's not a big deal, you know, like a, a, at all. I mean, someone broke a toenail or that, you know, and then the Dito said like someone doesn't have toes or leg, like you can go all ends of the spectrum. So if you kind of find a way to acknowledge that, that that's how they're feeling and almost make them laugh or shake it off, that, that that's probably the a great way to, to think about it. Awesome. Those, these are amazing questions and I'm glad these are being recorded because the, the, spend more time thinking about this. This is great advice that I, again, I wish I had received when I was younger. Um, and I'm extremely proud to see you, you guys here and engage in asking these questions because I really think these can change your life um, for the better. So good stuff. Thank I just you. wanted to quickly uh, shout out Dido a little bit because in college, I took a uh, communication and, and pop culture class. And so that was really at the beginning of the, like when positive psychology started becoming more prominent in pop culture. Um, and so it was taught in a kind of in reflection and kind of now what I've learned about positive psychology, it was taught in a kind of like toxic positivity type of way of that you have to ignore the negative and like don't focus on the negative. And I think what was really great about what Dito and uh, Dr. Hong said it as well, is that, you know, there are negative things that happen. There are, there is pain in the world. There is suffering in the world. So it's not about ignoring it. It's about acknowledging it. And it's about, um, you know, really validating those people's feelings, but also thinking about, you know, trying to, to find the positive and in, in everything that's happening. And so, um, I just wanted to, you know, like this is this was better than that that unit in my college class. So I just wanted to give you a little shout out. Yeah, I take it, man. We just, <laughs> thank you, much appreciated, man. We try to make you real. That's awesome. Good stuff. Well, thank you so much. It was always always great to uh, to see you all and and. Uh, hopefully keep growing and getting more and more people as, as my wife popped in and heard and said, I just wish I had this when I was younger. Well, how, how come this doesn't exist everywhere? <laughs> it's not too late. We got this guy. So see you here next week. Same day, same time. Thanks a lot, guys. All right. Thank you. Take care. Dito, thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Bye.